Hello! Welcome to my video. This is going to be a video about the five weeks I spent with Tarot of the Vampires. And here is the lovely box. I've been using this for the last five weeks as my main working deck. And I'm just going to talk through some of my experience working with this deck during that time. First section is going to be me talking a bit about the structure of this tarot deck. Then the next bit will be my experience and then the final bit will be just some like fun <laughs> correspondences to go with the deck. So the major arcana in the Tower of Vampires has a narrative kind of feel. We follow this woman as she becomes a vampire. So the fool's journey is someone becoming a vampire and it's very much a metaphor for like stepping into your power as you will see in the final card. Not every card in the major arcana shows her journey, but I pulled out the ones that do. So here we have the Fool, and this is our lovely protagonist. I did see a video where I think the author said he thinks of her as being called Lily. I actually named this vampire Ambrose because he's holding a rose and he's a vampire. And in this deck, roses represent vampires and lilies represent humans. And that is actually what we see on the back of the cards, the vampires and the humans. So this is Lily and Ambrose, and Ambrose actually means immortal, which is quite fun. And also roses in the name. So she's meeting him on a night's walk. The next time we see them, they're together in the lover's card. And I think she's offering him her blood, and I think he's a bit unsure in this one. Then we see them again in the death card, and she's actually agreed to be turned into a vampire in this one. And obviously Ambrose is looking a bit pensive there. And then the next time we see Ambrose and Lily is in the devil card and this is a very metal looking devil. She's been enslaved by this demonic kind of uh, bat-like vampire lord and we will see what happens to them in the next couple of cards. So here we see Lily again and she is obviously looking very vampiric. She is actually slaying the dark lord, the batty vampire. So she's kind of stepping into her power and really claiming her vampiric nature. And then the final card we see her in is the world card. And then she is that she's standing on a globe, a sort of statue. We have the animals. There's like an angel there, sort of depicted that we see in the typical kind of world card. And here she's holding a rose to represent her vampiric nature and a lily to represent her human nature. And the book basically explains she's kind of been able to balance those two things and she's not become like evil she's still able to retain like her humanity i love this rich orange it's i guess the sun setting she's fully stepped into her vampiric kind of immortal self one thing i really like about this deck is the outfits are really on point <laughs> she's got really amazing shoes on can i have those shoes please so there she is lily has stepped into her power as a vampire one of the other cool things about this deck is in each of the suits, the twos and the tens actually kind of begin and end with each other. So here is the two and here is the ten of wands. So here we have this vampire who's using, I think the book explains it's like blood magic to create these wings, these bat wings to fly with. So here we see him like taking off and then by the time he gets to the ten, he's using his powers to save his lover. I think this is a lover or a male, the book says. We're not entirely sure. But I really love the beginning, kind of the end quality to these, that they're linked. There is a like a three-hour, sort of almost like director's commentary style thing between the author of this deck and the artist. I'll put a link into it um, below. It's how I realised there was links between the twos and the tens, because they talk about it in that commentary. It's really interesting, because they point out a lot of like cool things in the deck as well. So here we have the two of cups and the ten of cups. And obviously we see this vampire and this human creating a connection here in the two of cups. And then by the ten of cups, they are... Well, the book says they've worked it out. They've, they've made this crazy situation work. <laughs> so they are together by the ten of cups, and we have this like rainbow sort of going on in this bar behind them, which is really cool. I like that kind of addition. What I should say is that the the minor arcana suits aren't entirely these like these people's story. Um, it's just the twos and the tens that have a commonality and a visual link. So the next set of twos is the two of swords and the ten of swords. So here we have a vampire hunter. You can see behind them, 
this vampire who is here is kind of emerging out of the grim darkness. Creepy image actually. I've actually pulled this card quite a few times and it's actually hit really well but that figure in the background really adds something to the reading and obviously by the 10 this vampire hunter has managed to slay this vampire. He's doing his level best to have a very dramatic death scene here. So yeah, so we have the two and the ten of swords ending in a vampire death there. And the last two and ten set we have is the two of pentacles and the ten of pentacles. And here we have a vampire <laughs> hanging a picture of his family and his vampire mistress over the fireplace. Time to get to the culmination of the tens, he has created longevity and a family. And his vampire mistress is kind of merged with his other his other peeps in his family. I really love the attention to detail that's in this deck and I'm going to talk about the aces next because they have some like fun well building that goes along with them because this book has a description for each card and it sort of tells you what's going on in the scene of this card almost like a mini story so I'll get onto that next. So here we have all of the aces together. One of the things I like to do when I'm looking at a new deck is like to lie out some of the cards together I often do it with the court cards and the major arcana, but I like doing it with the aces as well. So here we have the ace of wands, and I'm just going to read you something from the guidebook because it's quite interesting. More than anything else, the vampires in this deck hold sacred the potent vitality found in their blood. The wands are depicted as ankhs, the ancient Egyptian symbol for life. These ankh wands are used principally by mystically inclined vampires known as blood mages who can tap into their own vitae to create dazzling effects. So basically in this deck, in the one suit, you will see lots of figures and vampires who use the potent kind of vitality of their blood to create blood magic and to use it to their will. And I flipping loved that. I was like, yes, thank you for that world building. <laughs> thank you for that narrative like take on the ones. And I absolutely loved it. It makes so much sense for it to be linked to like blood and fire and ones. I I Love it. This image is so beautiful as well. It almost looks like I always want to, I always think of it almost as like being a dawn, but it is more like a sunset in some respects as well, because they are night creatures. But I love that you can see her blood's kind of like glowing within her with that kind of potent magic. So cool. Next we have the Ace of Cups. And I'll just very briefly read the description of the cups from the guidebook. Though monstrous by nature, vampires are renowned for their love of beauty, music, and artwork of all kinds. The chalices and other vessels are marked with the Vesca Piscus, concentric circles that represent worlds coming together in unity and hint at the mysteries of the Holy Grail. The vampires in this suit seek out connection to remind themselves of their human souls. So that is a lovely description of the Ace of Cups. And here we can see that symbol on the cups. And it's kind of like emerging out of this kind of cosmic sky. It almost, it almost looks a bit watery, but it is meant to be clouds and kind of stars. I really like this card. I've pulled this a couple of times, actually. Next card is the Ace of Swords. And I'll just read you this from the guidebook. There are few beings in the world as lethal as a vampire. The swords in this suit are represented by an array of weaponry and sharp, stabby implements. Here you will find the schemes and manoeuvres of the most cunning and aggressive vampires alongside their deadliest enemies. So that is a nice description of the Ace of Swords. You can see the sword has bat wings and an eye, and it's almost like hovering in this person's hand they're barely touching it and i like these kind of whiffs of they look like incense smoke which i like as well the final ace is the ace of pentacles and i'm just going to read this as well vampires immortality allows them to accumulate great wealth and power for themselves the pentacles are depicted as the seal of the eternal order a shadow government made up of elite vampires who meddle in the affairs of mortal nations and manipulates the world in accordance with their design. So here we have the emblem of the Eternal Order who appear throughout the Pentacles suit. Yeah, that is the main things I wanted to just point out about the structure of the deck. So in this next section I'm going to talk about my experience with the deck and also I'm going to point out a few things about some of the cards. So before I go ahead I just want to say this deck was really fun to use. I loved the storytelling aspect of this. This feels very much like an urban fantasy. It's very much post and um, rice vampires. It's not like the gothic kind of brooding heroes so much. It's much more about 
the kind of modern vampire who lives in our world and has all parallel lives to humans. It's very much that urban fantasy vibe. I've read a lot of urban fantasy books over the years. Not. <laughs> she had a dream about this card. This is the moon card. And this actually depicts a Rusalka. And if you look carefully, even though she's beckoning you into this water below, all is not as it seems because she looks like some sort of creepy creature. She's probably going to drown you, honestly. But I like the description in the guidebook of this. It sort of talks about how vampires have been, have been imagined differently throughout different cultures throughout history. This is one of my favourite cards in the deck. This is a strength card. And if you look at her, she's really digging her nails into the ground to keep control of her bloodlust. This kind of inner hunger is like really reaching out of her. It's like almost exploding out of her. And she's trying desperately to keep it in check. Very cool. When I watched the commentary between the artist and the writer for this deck, they talked about this card and they explained that it's actually based on an image of a teenage Bedabelle Wem. And I thought that was really cool. This literally looks like it could be the cover of a YA novel, <laughs> like a YA fantasy novel. So much fun. I pulled this card a couple of times during the sort of the course of the five weeks. Here we have the Knight of Swords. This is actually based on the Underworld films. The character called Celine, she's a death dealer in that film, played by Kate Beckinsale. She's very cool. It also gives me kind of like Anita Blake vibes, but it is a reference to Underworld. This reminds me of like, and it's not meant to be, but this is, the guidebook talks about this person being like hounded by vampires and they're like really scared of like the sun going down and they've kind of barricaded themselves in to their house to try and keep safe and she's got crosses kind of dotted around. It essentially makes me think of some sort of alternative universe Buffy or um, Faith from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Really cool. This is Temperance. This is actually one of my favourite cards in the entire deck. I love that she has this beautiful ancient Greek vase and it's got a depiction of Artemis, goddess of the hunt. One of the things I learned to appreciate from the commentary between the artist and the writer in the video was how much thought was put into the lighting. So obviously it's set at night, but if you actually look at each card, the artist has done an incredible job of lighting each card. The next card we have is the Empress, and this is actually supposed to be Lilith. And of course we know Lilith as like the first kind of wife of Adam. This world she's sitting in makes me think of some sort of primordial Eden where she's sitting naked and she's got these animals all over her. Like she's this very ancient Earth Mother goddess. I absolutely love it. So in terms of my experience with this deck, I found it to be a really, really good all-rounder. It read very clearly from the first instance of using it. I used it for a quite a few different types of reading, shadow work, kind of more spiritual related readings, more mental health stuff, you know, just lots of different types of readings. And quite honestly, it was very good in all different types of things. Sometimes I find decks don't perform very well for certain types of readings. This one felt like a very good all rounder. I think we connected really well straight away. It probably helps that I absolutely love <laughs> urban fantasy and vampires tend to be like a really big part of urban, fa urban fantasy novels. Vampires aren't really like a favourite of mine necessarily but I they seem to appear in a lot of the stuff that I read and or watch so <laughs> like I was a big fan of True Blood for many years. I read quite a few of the books it was that series was based on. I was obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel the TV show. Absolutely love Angel. He's my favourite vampire. I really liked Vampire Diaries. I liked both brothers, Stefan and Damon. I can't pick between them. They're both great. And yeah, I, I watch a lot of stuff like that. And specifically in that kind of early 2000s period, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely based in the RWS system. Obviously, it does deviate slightly in some of the images, but they feel very easy to understand and intuitive. I never pulled a card over the past sort of five weeks and felt like I didn't understand what the deck was trying to tell me. Obviously that will happen, you know, it does happen, but it happens more with certain types of decks and with this one it just felt so straightforward. So the readings were so flowy and so, I don't know, they were quite fun because the imagery is so like poppy and brightly coloured and there's just a lot of character to each of the cards and a lot of sort of narrative storytelling to each of the cards. It just felt like really fun to read with. And I enjoyed reading the descriptions in the guidebook. I read about half of the book during the sort of five weeks I worked with this because I tend to resonate quite strongly with the idea of like the fool's journey 
and sort of Joseph Campbell's ideas about the monomyth um, and the hero's journey, this deck sort of aligns very closely with how I read tarot. And I feel like that's part of the reason we mesh so well. It also reminds me a little bit of the Tower of the Haunted House, although I think I prefer this one. I think this one's a bit more fun. I read graphic novels, I like comics, so this kind of looks like one giant urban fantasy <laughs> um, graphic novel and I love that. I think it's really dynamic. I love how much the cards pop on the table and they kind of, um, there's something to be said for a deck that can kind of like cheer you up just with like the art style. Not actually a, a single card I think I dislike, which is unusual for me. I even, at first I wasn't keen on this card, but the more I looked at it, the more I kind of appreciated it. This is a newly kind of turned vampire who's enjoying her kind of extra sort of heightened senses and she's kind of levitating over the cityscape. And we can see the, the sun has set, we've got this kind of warm yellow happening and then we kind of fade into the blues and these amazing stars. And I love the way her dress is kind of blowing in the wind. Oh, it's just so good. I really like it. I really like this as well. This is kind of like Mardi Gras style. And this is kind of this vampire on a float, sort of driving it forward with her will. And I like that we've got the comedy and tragedy masks sort of pulling the float. It's really cool. Again, we can see how great the lighting is in these cards. I think a lot of time and care and love has gone into this deck. It's not something that's just been pumped out for, you know, whatever reason. It's definitely something that I think the both the artist and the creator, the writer, care a lot about. And I, I can definitely see it in the structure of the deck. Um, and, you know, even just some of the more little details. There's correspondence. Is this? <laughs> this was a partially like a joke. I mean, these correspondences are like half fun. They're not meant to be like fully serious. But um, one of the things I like to do is kind of pair like decks with like incense or crystals or like books specifically. I really like pairing them with books. Um, I bought this Stanford incense. It's called Vampire's Kiss and it smells not like my favourite smell in the world but it smells quite sort of powdery and um it does it just I can kind of see how it, you could think vampire when you smell it but yeah that's kind of an incense that I've been burning and I'm going to continue burning with this deck until I use it up I probably won't rebuy it my next correspondence is this piece of carnelian I actually chose this because it kind of reminded me of Lily's hair here we have a picture of her same colour as her hair. Also, it's got that kind of vibe of stepping into your power. It's very fiery. It reminded me of some of the sort of wand suits in this deck. I didn't couldn't actually find like a book that I think like fully encapsulate this this the kind of the vibe of this deck. I'm just gonna really rapid fire throw some urban fantasy books at you who kind of focus on modern vampires in kind of like an urban setting, because that's very much the vibe here. So we've got Suki Stackhouse novels, but also the show True Blood, which they're based on. Really fun. They're kind of like Southern mysteries. I like Suki. She's very sweet. Next one would be the Messy Thompson series. Messy Thompson is a shapeshifter. There's a lot of werewolf action in this one. She also solves mysteries, but there's lots of vampires, lots of vampire politicking. Really fun. Next one is the Cassie Palmer series. It reminds me a little bit of Buffy. There's quite a lot of like Greek mythology in it again it's an urban fantasy she's like the pythia the new pythia so she's like a psychic her name is cassandra so you get the link there <laughs> and the first book isn't very good but i'd carry on into the series because they are really really good fun recommendation is the anita blake vampire hunter novels these came out in the early 90s the vampires in them are a little bit mopey they're a bit am rice like <laughs> but yeah they're good fun and i recommend anita's antics although the they stop, the books stop being good at about book seven or so. In terms of TV, I'm going to say True Blood. Definite True Blood vibes here. I also recommend Angel the series, which was the spin-off from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Angel particularly is fantastic. It definitely has like outsider vibes. I'd also recommend Vampire Diaries. So the spin-off, the originals, which I never really watched properly, but I did watch Vampire Diaries all the way through. The Underworld films again they're not amazing but they're really good fun i remember going to the cinema to watch the first one <laughs> i think it came out in like 2003 i loved kate beckinsale that she was so she was very kick-ass loved her so yeah that is i think most of my recommendations this last section i'm just going to read the description of this card because i actually really like it <laughs> this kind of looks like the guy from supernatural dean i'm all right 
But yeah, um, let's put this down. In the dead of night, a vampire performs a secret ritual, known only to those who study the old blood magics. Her incense burner echoes the ancient Egyptian boat that ferried the sun on its journey through the underworld. By the power of her will, a mortal is drawn to her side, and sorcered by a call he cannot name. Her lips part in pleasure at the success of her spell. The passion of the ones is made manifest in the threes. With this card, we commit ourselves to the course of action we have begun. We stride forth boldly in the pursuit of our goals and follow through on our promises. Honour your ambitions, prepare properly and maintain momentum. There is no turning back. The Three of Wands also suggests that when you exercise your willpower to change your relationship with the external world, you may experience an excruciating waiting period before you know if your plans are successful. You have set several things in motion. Keep your enthusiasm high and believe in what you have chosen to manifest. This card is favourable to expansion of all kinds, new ventures, new personal explorations and new ways of thinking. More is more. And then we have the reversed. I think the book is worth reading if you buy this deck. Don't ignore the book. Um, it's worth it just for those opening paragraphs for each card. Every single card has one. This first section is all about what's going on here and the kind of like a mi almost like a mini story. That was just a brief snapshot of my experience with Terror of the Vampires over that course of the five weeks. And yeah, I'm looking forward to using this even more because I had such a good time with it. And I think it's a new favourite, actually. I kind of love it. Love. <laughs> so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.